tonight, Australia and the US united a show of solidarity, provoking China in a historic meeting of leaders. Light rail smash up, a car crashes into a tram in Surrey Hills. A new COVID threat, a doctor infected, Brisbane hospitals locked down, a critical 72 hours. Incredible escape, a woman bitten all over in a shark attack before swimming and walking to safety. The lightning bolt that really shook Sydney, stunning scenes on our harbour. A giant of the airwaves, Sydney Radio's great kingmaker, John Brennan, dead at 89. And how the Eels' big comeback could be the making of Para as a title contender. Live from Sydney, 7 News with Michael Usher and Angela Cox. Good evening. Australia has taken a big step in further provoking China, declaring a new dawn of political power in the Indo-Pacific region. Prime Minister Scott Morrison made that statement in solidarity with India, Japan and US President Joe Biden. A historic meeting that also saw leaders agree to supply one billion COVID vaccines in Southeast Asia. Diplomatic strength in numbers. Namaste. Konnichiwa. And from Australia, g'day. World leaders summoned during a global crisis with a united purpose to counter China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific. It is the Indo-Pacific that will now shape the destiny of our world. Appearing virtually, US President Joe Biden. A free and open Indo-Pacific is essential. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. We will work together closer than ever before. PM Yoshihide Suga of Japan. I wish to firmly advance our cooperation. And Scott Morrison. Welcome what I think will be a new dawn in the Indo-Pacific. Emerging from the COVID crisis, the leaders agreed to provide one billion doses of the vaccine to developing countries in Southeast Asia by the end of 2022. Australia committing $100 million to the cause. Let us together create a different future. On social media, a not-so-subtle dig. Unconstrained by coercive power. From the White House to the world. The Quad rises to new heights. America's National Security Advisor reveals leaders agreed to meet in person at the end of the year. And they made clear that none of them have any illusions about China. After today's meeting, a celebration for President Biden. His $2 trillion stimulus package now law, prompting the OECD to upgrade US growth forecasts. As the OECD welcomes a new Secretary General, former Finance Minister Matthias Cormann. Beating all nine rivals after a six-month campaign, it's the most senior appointment of an Australian candidate to an international body for decades. This is an incredibly exciting opportunity. Uh, there is a, a big job to be done. Overcoming the odds and cementing Australia's position as a leader on the world stage. Jennifer Beshwati, 7 News. With the second round of Pfizer vaccine shots beginning tomorrow, confirmation today that Australia's COVID-free streak is over. A doctor has tested positive to the virus in Brisbane, sparking frantic contact tracing. Their Premier declaring the next three days will be critical. It's the scenario that highlights the threat frontline workers face. This has been uh, very quick from uh, the contact to the diagnosis. A Brisbane doctor who is not yet vaccinated, treating COVID patients with the UK strain, herself coming down with the disease. This doctor wore appropriate uh, PPE during the time she was with the patients. Her infection bringing with it an end to the Australia-wide 42-day COVID-free streak, triggering a lockdown of Brisbane's hospital system. The next 72 hours is pretty critical to see if there has been any uh, further community spread. But if any trigger-happy premiers are thinking of hitting the panic button... No, we don't want to see uh, shutdowns or, or border closures as a result of this. The doctor was at work on Wednesday. Her day off Thursday played out like a contact tracer's nightmare, visiting a cafe, a gym and a pub. We do have a little bit of work to do with respect to contact tracing. New South Wales notching up 55 days with no community transmission, only one infection among returned travellers. Fears around the AstraZeneca vaccine also ruled out, the World Health Organisation declaring there's no evidence it causes blood clots, concerns which saw the vaccine rollout paused across Europe. Tomorrow will mark three weeks since the first of the COVID jabs were administered here. Those recipients will be eligible for their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, making them the first Australians with complete COVID immunity. 
Among them, Jane Malashuk will join the PM once again, rolling up her sleeve. And Evan Batten joins us now live. Evan, you have a bit of breaking COVID news now. Yeah, Michael, you'd have to say this really is just for abundant caution, but New South Wales Health has just put out a statement saying that anyone who's just come back from Brisbane who was there on Thursday and went to that cafe, the hotel or the pub uh, should go into self-isolation now until uh, March th until March 25th. Uh, that is just to really monitor for any symptoms and, of course, if any symptoms do emerge, they should go and get tested. Michael. Right, Evan in the newsroom, thank you for that. A car has slammed into the light rail near Moore Park. The P-plater failed to stop at the lights on South Downing Street, smashing into a carriage. No passengers were injured, neither was the driver. Traffic in the area was banked up while a tow truck removed the car. The light rail is now being checked for damage. A swimmer has survived a shark attack at a popular south coast tourist spot. The 63-year-old woman was left bloodied and covered in bite marks. Surf Lifesavers say she was swimming with friends when the predator bumped her in the back. Michelle Boots, a well-known Marimbula local lucky to survive her morning ritual, bitten by a shark while swimming off Main Beach at 6.45. All of a sudden I just felt this strike. Um, and realised that I'd been bitten by a shark. He just struck and disappeared. The 63-year-old Pambula Surf Life Saving Club life member and 2020 Bega Citizen of the Year was with two other people. She made it out of the water, bloodied and covered in bite marks. She walked to a nearby cafe to call for help. Paramedics commenced their, uh, uh, their uh, um, treatment. She was stable and um, they commenced first aid by applying uh, pressure bandages. Police and the rescue helicopter brought in to search for the shark. Beaches in a 20 kilometre stretch around Marimbula will be closed until tomorrow. I was just scared in case he was going to have another go at me. Once I realised I was safe, I was fine. Today, Michelle was taken to Bega Hospital. Researchers will look at her wounds to determine what species the shark was. Photographs of the wound, as well as potentially each teeth embedded in the lady's body, may give us clues as to the type of species this shark was. The local legend says she'll be back in the water for another swim. You can't hold ocean swimmers back. Hayden Nelson, 7 News. A Wollongong man has been stabbed multiple times in the abdomen during a random robbery on the street. The 53-year-old was walking home from the CBD with his wife when they were set upon just after 11 last night. His attacker, thought to be in his early 20s, fled after stealing his mobile phone. If you were in that area at that time and had a dash cam, could you have a look through it? Because you might hold the key to finding this male person, this offender that we're looking for. He is described as Caucasian and was wearing an all-black tracksuit. His victims in a serious but stable condition. Sydney siders had to take cover as severe storms sent rain and huge bolts of lightning crashing down across the city last night. More than 4,000 strikes were recorded in just five hours and another deluge is not far away. Putting on a striking show, a slow-moving storm passing over Sydney. The bolt barely missing ferries in Circular Quay. Lighting up the skies across the Illawarra at Bexley, even as far as the state's mid-north coast. This is Friday night in Harrington. This is my nightclub on a Friday night. Even off Wollongong last night, there was a, a supercell off the coast there that sat there for about three hours. And we had a lot of photos and video sent in of that because it was just a strobe light for literally three or four hours. In the city, deep red skies at sunset signalled the storm's arrival. Also delivering a drenching with traffic forced to navigate flash flooding. This at Walleye Creek. Slow moving and so they actually dropped lots of rain all at once. Over the past 24 hours, 54 millimetres has fallen at Brogers Creek in the Illawarra, 45 millimetres at Little Bay and 42 at Marrickville Golf Club. They also got about 30 mils in about half an hour. And while we woke to blue skies, there is plenty more rain on the way, with another 30 to 40 millimetres expected to fall across Sydney tomorrow. If we get thunderstorms, it'll be a lot more. And we are starting to see that on models with more storms and rain areas across Queensland and New South Wales in particular. So there could be some more nights like last night. Amber Laidler, 7 News. A 30-year-old man has been charged with high-range drink driving after he allegedly crashed into a Bardwell Park home and fled the scene early this morning. Three people were inside when the vehicle ploughed into the home with the dog squad called in to track him down. His licence was suspended. He'll face court next month.
Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt is out of hospital after being treated for an infected leg. He was given antibiotics for the painful condition of cellulitis. Mr Hunt has thanked the staff who looked after him. He'll be back at work on Monday. And Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews is out of intensive care after breaking his back in a fall. His doctors say for now there are no plans for surgery, sources have told Seven. Mr Andrews is in a back brace and taking some slow steps with the assistance of a walking frame. Well, high rent and unaffordable housing is forcing essential workers out of Sydney. Developers are accused of taking advantage of a loophole in state government legislation, supercharging the price of what should be affordable units. John Townsend is on the front line. He's part of New South Wales' strong COVID health response but can't see a future. In Sydney. Either I stay living in Sydney and rent for the rest of my life or I look elsewhere. I'm seriously considering whether it's worth staying in Sydney just because the numbers don't stack up. Developers are accused of using a legislative loophole, meaning nothing can stop them building low-cost units but renting them out at a high price. The Affordable Renting Housing State Environmental Planning Policy should protect tenants. Our most vulnerable in our community and our key workers are missing out on this housing. The consequences are dire for essential workers like John, who are forced to travel greater distances to work. When it comes to living and working in shift work, you're basically trading distance for sleep. There's no requirement that the rent for those units be set at a rate that's affordable for low income earners. The government introducing a new policy to combat the loophole. Boarding houses should be classified as affordable rental buildings and, and must be managed through a community housing provider. Changes to the policy will be made within three weeks. The government finally closing the loophole, giving renters some hope they'll find affordable housing in future. It would just be nice to be able to know that having your own home is something that's achievable as opposed to something that is, for, at least for me, way out of my league. Isabel Mullen, 7 News. The family of George Floyd, whose death led to a racial reckoning across America, has won a record payout from the city of Minneapolis. The settlement dwarfs the one awarded to Justine Ruzchek Damon's family and comes as Floyd's alleged killer, a former city police officer, stands trial. How much should an American city pay when its police force is involved in a death as shocking as George Floyd's? He's here with me in my heart. Ten months on, an answer. 27 million US dollars. Because if I could get him back, I would give all of this back. His eight minute, 46 second knee to the neck killing and his dying words, I can't breathe, a rallying cry for global protests. The payout, say his lawyers, spurs other cities weighing limits on the force police can use. They have 27 million reasons now why they should. The amount, a record for Minneapolis, just two years ago. The city paid 20 million US to settle the case of Australian Justine Damon Ruzchek. In 2017, a police officer shot and killed her. The Floyd payout comes at a legally sensitive time, halfway through jury selection in the trial of his accused murderer. Derek Chauvin has pleaded not guilty. Some question whether the sacked policeman can now get a fair trial when his old employer has so profoundly accepted responsibility. Our black community has endured deep and compounding trauma over this last year. Today, George Floyd's family went to the intersection where he died. The payout, a victory, but a murder trial yet to come and Floyd still an inspiration way beyond Minneapolis. May George live in power. In the United States, Tim Lester, 7 News. The stars came together today at Rose Hill to get the Sydney Autumn Racing Carnival off and racing. Today's Pink Day event helped raise awareness about breast cancer, but on the track, all eyes were on making it to the Golden Slipper. Ladies' Day at Rose Hill, and fittingly, a detailed sculpture of the Queen of the Turf, Winks, greeted racegoers. This is a piece of history. What do you think of it? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So, so real and lifelike. It was amazing. She was just the queen of the turf. A touch of pink united everyone on course. To see everyone turn up to the, the racing here wearing pink is something very special. 
Every dollar that will be raised will help the McGrath Foundation for Breast Care Nurses, which bring free support to families experiencing breast cancer. I'm here because I want to bring awareness um, that these breast care nurses are essential. Christine Arnu lifted the mood. When she sang My Island Home and Let's Come Join the Party, I was actually really into it. Outside, the real stars were vying for the last two places in next week's $3.5 million golden slipper. Tiger Malay charges at him. But Shakira just held on. Shakira will give Chris Wallace's stable another chance next Saturday, while Arcaded snuck home for James Cummings. The favourite home, Arcaded, won it by a length and a half. It was a good win. It's not going to knock the golden slipper market around too much, though, is it? Coolmore Classic honours went to Queensland horse Crone with Tim Clark on board. Michelle Bishop, 7 News. Well, Sally Bowery joins us now. Sal, good evening to you. We haven't seen the last of the wild weather. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Michael. We've got a rain event marching towards us tonight with a sharp drop in temperatures too. In fact, this afternoon, some flurries started falling across Threadbow with the cold front arriving in Sydney tomorrow morning. That'll be a dramatic departure from today. We woke up to fog this morning, visibility down to 500 metres across the city and around Wiseman's Ferry on the central coast. As the day got underway, those temperatures soared five degrees above average Average in the city, 29 degrees, warmer in the west. It was in fact 7 degrees above the norm at Sydney Olympic Park. Right now it is still a very warm 32 degrees at Penrith. Sydney's wet weather will start first thing in the morning. Around 15 to 30 millimetres of rain is forecast heavier if you're under a storm. We'll also see some damaging wind gusts along the coast up to 80 kilometres an hour. We're in for a pretty wild start to the day. I'll have a full rundown of the rain with Sydney's seven-day forecast a little later. OK, thanks, Sal. One of Sydney's secrets is set to be revealed after the break. The million dollar makeover for a hidden piece of paradise. Delivery danger an accident leaves a scooter rider with serious head injuries. In the middle of a war zone, incredible access to the violence in Myanmar. Later, beating an incurable condition, one family's fight to bring groundbreaking trials to Australia. Back online, the Queen zooms in for her first appearance since that interview. Welcome back. A food delivery worker has undergone surgery after his motor scooter was hit by a car on the Princess Highway at Rockdale. That happened last night. Paramedics treated the 20-year-old man before he was taken to St George Hospital with serious head injuries. Police arrested the 22-year-old driver. She was taken for mandatory testing before being released. A hidden gem of the northern beaches is receiving a million dollar upgrade. A new walkway to make Manly Dam the envy of Greater Sydney. Even if locals are worried the beach's best kept secret will soon be out. It's picturesque and a little known secret amongst the locals. Rich in history, Manly Dam was phased out as a water source by the 1940s. The jewel in the crown of kind of the northern beaches here. Now the historic reservoir is in line for a $1.7 million facelift. What we'll be building is nearly 400 metres worth of raised boardwalk to get pedestrians off the road and into the parkland. Sometimes we forget that just, just as important as the, the hard infrastructure to build Build our city is our soft infrastructure and our parklands. The dam is teeming with native plants and wildlife, even an ancient climbing fish, and is a hotspot for picnickers, boaters and bushwalkers. We get everybody you can imagine. We get um, walkers, joggers, uh, mothers with, with prams. The funding injection here at Manly Dam is part of the state government's strategy to increase green open spaces across Greater Sydney. A dozen councils are in line for the funding and will match it for new pedestrian footpaths, cycleways and parks. There was some initial concern the walkway wouldn't be popular with mountain bikers who come from all over Sydney to ride the trails. I don't think this has got anything to do with that. It's in a totally different part of the park. The only people that are opposed to it are the locals because they want to keep it a secret for the rest of Sydney. The project is due to be completed by September next year. Emily O'Brien, 7 News. We've been given an incredible insight into the deadly violence in Myanmar. A protester wearing a head-mounted camera documented the moment activists sparked another clash. The latest rallies came a day after those forces were accused of killing 12 protesters, bringing the death toll to more than 70 since a military coup began last month. 
Torrential rain has left thousands homeless in Peru. Residents forced to escape the flooding on makeshift rafts with roads cut and rivers overflowing. Firefighters rescued one elderly woman trapped inside her house for hours. Neighbours thankfully heard her cries for help. More flooding and damage is expected. Shaking off the controversy surrounding the royal family, the Queen is looking to the stars, joining an online event as part of British Science Week. Her Majesty briefed on the latest updates from Mars. And I think it's fascinating to see the pictures of Mars. Um, unbelievable, really, to, to think one can actually see its surface. Scientists and schoolchildren all delighted by the Queen's first appearance since that interview. Well, it's a shocking crime that sparked fear and an online movement. Up next, the police officer accused of murder, the victim last seen in an Aussie backpacker hotspot. Nearly 200 charges in just two days. Sydney police cracked down on knives. And breaking records, we sit down with the Australian sports star that just cashed in big. That's next. We have breaking news. An emergency operation is unfolding right now at West Head. A 75-year-old man has fallen down an embankment and hit his head. We're being told he's in a critical condition. These pictures from our news helicopter show the rescue effort which is underway. He's being carried down the beach track so a helicopter can airlift him to hospital. A London police officer has been charged with the kidnap and murder of Sarah Everard. The marketing executive went missing while walking home last week. Remains found hidden on the city's outskirts now confirmed to belong to the 33-year-old. Bright and beautiful, strong and principled. That's how Sarah Everard's family described her the day they were told she had been murdered. My thoughts and prayers and those of the entire organisation remain with her and with them at this awful time. London's Assistant Police Commissioner, visibly shaken, would emerge just hours later to confirm it was one of his own who had allegedly killed Sarah. A serving police constable has tonight been charged with the kidnap and murder of Sarah Everard. Wayne Cousins, a 48-year-old diplomatic protection officer responsible for guarding Number 10 Downing Street, foreign embassies, even royal events, questioned but not stood down over an indecent exposure incident in a fast food store just three days before Sarah vanished. Her body was found dumped in bushland, those remains identified overnight. Everard hadn't been seen since last week when she vanished while walking home from a friend's house in Clapham, an area popular with Australian tourists and expats. Like everybody, I'm shocked and appalled. I think that the whole country will be united in uh, their feeling for her friends, uh, her family, and will share their shock and, and their grief. Shock and grief, which is spreading well beyond the UK. The fear women experience walking alone in public after dark echoed on social media across the world. We have all made phone calls, both real and fake. We have all held our keys between our fingers. A woman should have been allowed to walk home. This post shared two million times today. That no a woman should walk our, our streets in fear. Every woman uh, should feel able to walk our streets uh, in safety. Wayne Cousins will face court in a few hours as investigators try to piece together Sarah's final moments alive. Christian Galpset, 7 News. 195 people have been charged in a two-day police crackdown on knife crime throughout Sydney. 36 knives were seized across Western Sydney and the city in the blitz involving more than 300 officers over Thursday and Friday. Officers also uncovered an axe, battens and knuckle dusters and found drugs on more than 100 people. The man known as the kingmaker of Sydney Radio's biggest stars, John Brennan, has died. Breno had a real ear for talent, credited with launching the careers of Alan Jones, John Laws, Ray Hadley and many others. John Brennan began his radio career behind the microphone. Welcome now to the presentation of the 1978 MK Cup. But Breno, as he was affectionately known, gave listeners a voice, pioneering talkback radio. Talk radio is democracy in its purest form. A real voice for the Australian public. 
Bruno also discovered and mentored some of Australia's biggest personalities. Alan Jones, John Laws, Ray Hadley, Stan Zamanik, Ben Fordham and Chris Smith. Most became lifelong friends who carry heavy hearts today after his sudden death yesterday. Any success I've had in radio, I owe John Brennan a great debt of gratitude. This hurts a lot because not only are we so thankful for the pioneering legacy that he left us, creating talk radio and the most prominent format we have in radio, but, you know, personally, he was a great teacher. A man with an extraordinary ability to manage talent on and off air. Breno was a force of nature. He was the lion tamer controlling all the big egos of radio. Breno was the only person I know in the history of radio that had success in both music and talk formats. He famously turned Alan Jones from a rugby coach to a talk star. He literally put him down in front of a microphone, turned it on and said, show me what you can do. And the rest is history. Breno was also instrumental in filling Jones's shoes. Good morning, Sydney. This is Ben Fordham on 2GB. What was the last thing he said to you? He sent me a note just before I started the breakfast shift and he said, Ben, today more than ever, Australia needs people to strive for excellence. Keep being yourself. An OAM recipient who was inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame in 2002. Jones, a loyal friend to the end. He is shattered. He couldn't have got through an interview like that and it's one of the only days I can remember when Alan was short of a word. Australian radio and his beloved family now in mourning. He passed away suddenly. Jenny and Peter were with him. Uh, watched that beautiful man fade away to all of us. A light went out that night. John Brennan was 89. Ashley Hansen, 7 News. You might not know Liam Hendricks' name, but in the US, he's kind of a big deal. The Aussie baseballer has pitched himself into the record books, signing a $70 million contract to play for the Chicago White Sox. But our freshly minted superstar has told 7 News he almost gave up on his sporting dream. Of Hendricks trying to dig deep to Mazzara. Take strike three called! He's the Aussie Major League star who strong-armed his way into baseball history. Well, Liam Hendricks liked it right out of the hand. Mum and dad were ecstatic. They were over the moon. And rightly so. Their son, Liam Hendricks, now worth a record-shattering $70 million. Got him swinging with a slider, and that's the ball game. His three-year Chicago White Sox deal, the highest ever for a relief pitcher. I, think, I don't think it'll kick in until I first get, they get that first paycheck. And 96 miles an hour, and that's how the ball game ends. His value skyrocketing after helping Oakland Athletics to last year's division title. Strike three called, and a win a long time coming for the A's franchise. I finally got a chance to choose. I mean, I hadn't had a chance to choose which organization I was going to go to since I first went over to the States. That was 14 years ago, leaving Western Australia to pursue a dream that at times looked more like a nightmare. Ouch. Ditched by four teams in five seasons. Do you reflect on those days now, or is it all pretty much you're just looking ahead the whole time? Do you reflect on where you've come from? I mean, I, I think you have to look back. I mean, it's just going to repeat itself. The result, not bad for a kid from Perth who grew up with one thing on his mind. Was born basically kicking a footy. His dad, Jeff, a former West Perth footy club champion, encouraged his son to try other sports. This spot here is where Liam used to practice for hours every day. That was the baseball zone. And it's paying dividends. Liam rubbing shoulders with our highest paid sports stars. We did the mathematics on my, my current salary. So I have to work till I'm 412 to make the same salary. Now, on the eve of this year's Major League season, Australia's freshly minted sporting superstar determined to pay back the faith. I need to go out there and, and try and earn every single dollar I'm making by making sure I go out there every single day, ready to go, ready to make sure I'm putting my best foot forward. In the United States, David Woywood, 7 News. It's eye-watering money. Coming up, new hope for sufferers of a terminal genetic disease thanks to one very dedicated dad. A major global sporting win, how Penrith sold itself to the world. Celebrity shock, J-Lo's wedding off and A-Rod call it quits after a two-year engagement. Soon in sport, remember the Titans, league's big spenders flop in their season opener. And we'll wake up to a very different day tomorrow, wet and windy, the forecast soon.
Penrith has won the right to host the 2025 Canoe Slalom World Championships. It's a big win. It means a revamp for Whitewater Stadium and new facilities for our athletes. There is plenty of space to accommodate athletes, teams, officials and supporters. The plan includes a leisure area which the public will be able to visit and enjoy. There's new hope for sufferers of a terminal genetic disease predominantly affecting young men. In Australia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a death sentence, but that could be about to change thanks to pioneering medical research and one very dedicated dad. At 16, Emilio could have just five years to live. He's resilient, he's a good boy, he's happy, never complains. And what we want to do is give him some real hope. He received a terminal diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy at two. If he's lucky, he'll reach 30. The impacts of this disease for both the child and their family are profound and devastating. Predominantly affecting males, Duchenne syndrome is caused by a faulty gene on the X chromosome, which affects muscle development and function. He can't climb stairs, he can't run and jump like any other kid. And it's hard to watch as a parent. High doses of steroids has been the only way to slow disease progression until now. Looking at gene replacement therapy, but well, we can actually replace that faulty gene with an entirely new gene. The Australian government yet to implement trials which are underway overseas. If approved, this treatment will change the lives of one in 3,500 boys worldwide. Medical professionals are optimistic it will be made available in Australia within 12 months. Next week, Ellie and other Save Our Sons members will walk to Canberra to implore the Federal Health Minister to approve the therapy. Please, um, we need you to reduce the uh, red tape, the bureaucracy. To give boys like Emilio a fighting chance. Isabel Mullen, 7 News. Well, Jennifer Lopez and baseball legend Alex Rodriguez have broken up, calling it quits just before their wedding. J-Lo and A-Rod, as they're affectionately known by fans, split after a two-year engagement. The pair is now left to divide their property empire, which is rumoured to be worth a staggering $100 million. The market for big, and we mean big, TVs is growing, but how much does size really matter when it comes to optimum viewing and, more importantly, eye health? The experts' advice may surprise you. Don't miss that story soon on 7 News. But first, Matt, it was sport. Matt, good evening to you. The Eels oh, won, but the coach is not happy. Yeah, it's always easy to tell when he is happy, though, Michael and Ange. <laughs> good evening, everyone. It takes more than a big comeback win to please Brad Arthur. All the footy news is next. And the first half highlights from the Roosters and Manly, where you won't believe James Tedesco's first touch of the season. And Jeff Fennick and his protege ready to take on the world and ride a classic boxing tale. The NRL's new motto is Defy Impossible. That's exactly what James Tedesco has done with his first touch of the season. Kieran Foran ran out for his first game for Manly in six years, but Teddy's first touch of the footy was ridiculous, even by his standards. Four and provided the try assist for Ruben Garrick, but the Roosters stretched their lead to 26-4 by half-time. Who else but Tedesco bagging a double? Brett Morris scored his 166th try, now outright fourth all-time, and he had number 167 before the break. The Warriors have turned Gosford into mini Auckland. The Titans arrived with prized recruits David Fafita and Tino Fa'asua Maliawi today, but after all the big sending, spending and off-season hype, the Gold Coast flopped in a flat start to their season. The Kiwis say they'll keep it simple this year, and it's worked so far, a 19-6 win to start at their home away from home until at least late June, and maybe all season if it needs to be. Just being grateful for everything we're getting here. You know, we're, we're lucky and blessed to be here in Central Coast, especially in Terrible. Still, the Titans are confident it won't be long until they click and become a real threat. It won't take long to see where Parramatta really stand. They face the storm on Thursday night. While Trent Barrett's Bulldogs started with a loss to Newcastle, the Eels were good for half a game in Brisbane. 
better result, then um, we couldn't get the job done in the second half, isn't it? But we've still got a lot of work to do. The powerhouse turned wooden spooners, restarting under Broncos' sensation. His only thought was get the ball down. Coates went to hospital, soon followed by John Asiata. They have been cleared of neck damage. Matt Lodge had already done a hamstring and the Broncos needed to respect the opposition a bit more. I'm a little bit annoyed that we, we didn't show, show them enough respect early. Kevy's Broncos have to earn it back yet. Yeah, we'll get there. I'm very confident we'll get there. The Knights called Daniel Saifiti their alpha male. Two tries in his 100th game led Newcastle to a 32-16 win over Canterbury, soured by leg injuries to Kurt Mann and the 19-year-old bull, Bradman Best. Welcome back to coaching, Trent Barrett. Look, there's a lot of lessons there for them. They're disappointed and so they should be. Well, MacArthur FC lost second place to the rampant Melbourne City in the A-League last night. Jamie McLaren and Craig Noon hit the Bulls with a three-goal blitz within 12 minutes. Craig Noon dances around one and they have three! Winless for more than a month, Sydney FC keeper Andrew Redmayne's shocker gave Newcastle a 1-0 lead at Cogra tonight. Gun jockey Hugh Bowman and knockabout Newcastle trainer Chris Lees combined to win the $5 million All-Star Mile at Mooney Valley with Mugatu. The third running of the world's richest mile finished as a match race between Bowman on Mugatu and Damien Oliver's Russian Camelot. In Sydney, Magic Millions winner Crone made it three on the trot to take out the Group 1 Coolmore Classic at Rose Hill. Formula 1 testing started in Bahrain and Daniel Ricciardo's already feeling good with McLaren. His new car was fastest in the first session and seventh overall after the opening day. The medal rush continues for Australia's winter sports stars. Tess Cody won bronze in the snowboard slope style World Championships in Aspen this morning. The women are like on another level at the moment and I'm just really excited to be a part of that, it's been so sick. Cody joins the great Tora Bright as the only Aussie medalists in the event. Jason Day is six shots behind leader Lee Westwood after the second round at the Players' Championship. A day for eagle spotters at Sawgrass included Denny McCarthy's hole-in-one at the third and Brendan Todd's ace with a five-wood to the 194-metre eighth hole. Front hole location, easiest hole location on the green. But maybe not quite that easy. <laughs> No great mishaps at the island hole today, but Mark Leishman was a victim and he missed the cut by one shot. Sergio Garcia might rethink putting with his eyes closed. Brock Jarvis, remember the name because he's on track to become Australia's next boxing superstar. So says the biggest name of all, Jeff Fennick, who boasts plenty of special family ties to his fighter. The champion boxer turned teacher already rates pupil Brock Jarvis better than Jeff Fennick. And he does things better than I done when I was world champion. Jeff knows the sport better than, well, I believe he knows the sport better than anyone. Unbeaten over 18 pro bouts, he's two wins from fighting for a world title. Jarvis can punch and throws plenty. In his last fight after five rounds, I think he threw something like seven or eight hundred punches in five rounds, which is a lot of punches. On April 23 in Canberra, Jarvis fights KG New Zealander Nord Beauchamp, who taunts opponents. This is going to be our toughest fight. He's very, very awkward. We know what we've got to do, and, and I plan on doing it. Brock is the nephew of Pat Jarvis, the copper-cum footballer who pulled Fennec off the streets and on the road to triple world champion glory. Really, he let me off. A couple of great words of advice and stuff, and then, yeah, my life changed. Closer family ties... Fennec's daughter Kayla has been dating Brock for five years. It's close to home, but, you know, everyone's happy. Including Brock's trainer and would-be father-in-law. Very similar to the Johnny Lewis Jeff Fennec story. This, this is my son here on, on my left-hand side. He's, he's a part of my family. No guesses what Generation Next will be doing. Andrew McKinlay, 7 News. Brock is going to the big time, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, well, when it comes to TVs, bigger is increasingly better with the demand for huge screens more than tripling in recent years. But is there such a thing as too big? Well, no, according to manufacturers and retailers who say often we're choosing too small. The small screen just keeps getting bigger. I don't need no 
But are these giant televisions easy on the eye? We know that sitting too close to screens can cause problems, vision developing into short-sightedness. Sitting too far can also cause a problem. So how big is best? Standard human vision is about 160 degrees, but our cone of detail, so the amount of detail that we can see at one time, is about 40 degrees. If you were to draw a 40 degree arc, uh, it should hit both sides of the TV. Sony recommends sitting 2.1 metres away from a 55 inch screen in high definition and 2.3 metres from a 60 inch. But in 4K, the viewing distance range starts at 1.2 metres for a 65 inch TV. Most people in most living rooms uh, further than that easily. According to JB Hi-Fi, the 65-inch reigns supreme as the most popular television size for Aussie homes. But the 75 and 85-inch screens are on the up and are currently the fastest growing segments of the business. Um, but we have so many c customers that will purchase something smaller than what we recommend based on where their viewing is in the home and so many people come back and go, no, you're right, I need to get bigger. In 4K, surprisingly, as the screens get bigger, the recommended distances get smaller due to more pixels. For a 75 inch, you should sit at least 1.4 metres away, an 85 inch screen, 1.6. With regular breaks also recommended. Amber Laidler, 7 News. Sally is back now, and Sal, it was a hot one today, but a cold change is on the way. Yeah, that's right, Ange. Wet and windy weather will sweep into Sydney tomorrow morning with temperatures dropping dramatically. Sydney's seven day forecast is next. Tonight's Tonight. 7 News headlines, the Prime Minister has declared a new dawn of political power in the Indo-Pacific after meeting with leaders including US President Biden. There's been an emergency operation at West Head, a 75-year-old man in a critical condition after falling down an embankment. And a swimmer has told 7 News of her incredible escape after a shark attack left her covered in bites. Now, here's Sally with Sydney's weather. Thank you very much. Well, after a hot one today, a cold change is closing in on us tonight with widespread rain and even flood threats for some parts of the state tomorrow. Today, though, five degrees above average across the city. We hit a top of 29. Uh, it was even warmer around Sydney Olympic Park, eight degrees above average there. In terms of temperatures in our west, 33 was the top in Penrith, while Richmond was a top of 33 as well. Now, the cold front is just pushing through the southwest of New South Wales into tonight. It will trigger widespread rain. It will stall tomorrow and that will really intensify things. Right now we also have just some severe storms in this yellow area moving through Canamble, Lightning Ridge and Walgett. In fact, 47 millimetres fell in just an hour at the northern Tablelands at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Things will intensify into tomorrow. That northeastern corner of the state is the big threat where around 30 to 50 millimetres is forecast, but unfortunately catchments are already saturated in that area, so it has triggered some flood alerts there. Around the capital cities for tomorrow, 31 degrees into Brisbane. The rain should ease in Melbourne, a top of 18 degrees there. Partly cloudy skies in Adelaide, top of 20 degrees. While over on the west coast, it'll be very pleasant in Perth, a top of 30 degrees tomorrow. Across New South Wales tomorrow, in a word, rain is the story. Up to 50 millimetres is forecast and we will see most of that rain clear that southwestern corner as the day progresses. Also very windy across parts of the coast into tomorrow. Possibly heavy falls through the central tablelands, around 40 millimetres forecast for Bathurst and we can expect that wet weather to clear the Riverina over the next couple of hours. Across Sydney tomorrow, the rain will hit early as that cold front arrives. The warmest part of the day is actually going to be in the morning before that cooler change takes hold. 30 millimetres is forecast. Gusty winds expected along the coast up to 80 kilometres an hour with swell just sitting around that three metre mark. There is a chance also of a thunderstorm in the city tomorrow with those temperatures dropping back to 23 degrees. The good news is on Monday things should start to ease back just a few showers early in the morning. Morning, but we do have another bout of wet weather starting up. That'll be more towards the back end of the week. So it looks like we've got a very wet period ahead, Michael and Ange. All right, Sal, thank you for that. And that is 7 News for this Saturday. We'll have updates for you throughout the evening. Weekend Sunrise starts from 7 tomorrow from all the 7 News team. Thanks so much for your company. Have a great night. Good night.